One of the most effective yet pernicious tools of the status is language. Abraham Lincoln explained it this way. We all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor. While with others, the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. Here are two not only different but incompatible things, he said, called by the same name, liberty. And it follows that each of the things is, by the respective parties, called by two different and incompatible names, liberty and tyranny. Now, for the statist, tormenting us, controlling us, dictating to us, seizing from us, is explained as liberty. For the rest of us, it's tyranny. The statist misuses the word equality to great effect as he pursues uniform economic and social outcomes. And in this regard, he promises to make that which is imperfect, perfect, and that which is impossible, possible. And only if you surrender more and more of your liberty and property to him. Only then can his utopia, such as it is, be achieved. Consequently, the status rejects rights as being unalienable. Instead, he assumes the authority to determine who has rights and who does not, and then rations them accordingly. Last year in his commencement speech at a college, a graduating class at a college, Barack Obama made the point, he said, our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. But salvation is not governments to give. It is not a grant to mankind from mankind. Under the wrong conditions and in the wrong hands, this deviant view is a powerful tool against humanity. And yet this is where we are today. Although the soft tyranny has been building for decades, the most brazen and dangerous war against the civil society is being waged as we gather here this evening by this president and this Congress. They are scheming against the individual, liberty, private property, the rule of law, and ultimately future generations. And they are pushing on multiple fronts. In less than 10 months, the President and Congress have in effect nationalized many of our largest banks by using TARP funds to buy their stock. They have eviscerated the nation's bankruptcy laws by turning Chrysler and GM over to the UAW, an unsecured creditor, uh, debtor, and strong-armed secured investors. They are nationalizing the student loan system. They are claiming the power to dictate lending terms offered by mortgage companies and interest rates by credit card companies. They are dictating management salaries and bonuses in certain industries and seek to compel unionization of workforces across most industries without a secret ballot. The President and Congress have used the recession to launder tens of billions of dollars in a phony stimulus bill to their favorite political constituencies, including ACORN, the SEIU, and politicians and bureaucrats in state and local governments. In fact, so irresponsible, gluttonous, Arrogant and ideologically driven is this administration and Congress that they adopted a budget that will create nearly $12 trillion in debt over the next decade with the Congressional Budget Office declared unsustainable. And that's if we experience 4% growth every year, which we won't. Otherwise, it's closer to $21 trillion over the next 10 years. This was done at the same time the Federal Reserve pumped trillions into the financial system. So current fiscal and monetary policy have turned America into the largest debtor nation the world has ever known. It threatens to destroy our currency through inflation, the full faith and credit of the United States government, and the liberty, opportunities, and security of future generations born and unborn. And that is a contemptible disgrace. And they're not done. As further evidence of their compassion and good deeds, the President and Congress are in the midst of nationalizing 17% of our economy, better known as the health care system. The government has already run up over $55 trillion in unfunded obligations for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid entitlements. Now, how do they justify this? 
well, everyone should have affordable quality health care, right? And the only way to accomplish that, of course, is for the government to take it over. Everybody wants something for nothing. And that's what Obama and Congress are promising, something for nothing. Now, have you noticed that the status can't quite get his propaganda straight? On the one hand, he promises national health care that will ensure quality care for all Americans. On the other hand, they say we spend too much money on health care and we need to cut it. Well, which is it? Do we spend too much or do we need to cut it? Writing in the left-wing New Yorker, a fellow by the name of John Cassidy, who poses as an economist, had, uh, <laughs> had something very interesting to reveal. He wrote, so what does all this add up to? The U.S. government is making a costly and open-ended commitment to help provide health coverage for the ma vast majority of its citizens. I support this commitment, and I think the federal government's spending priorities should be altered to make it happen. But let's not pretend that it isn't a big deal and that it will be self-financing or that it will work out exactly as planned. It won't. He wrote, many Democratic insiders know all this. What is really unfolding, I suspect, is a scenario that many conservatives feared. The Obama administration is creating a new entitlement program which, once established, will, virtually, will be virtually impossible to rescind. At some point in the future, the fiscal consequences of the reform will have to be dealt with in a more meaningful way. But by then, the principle of universal coverage will be well established. Even a 21st century Ronald Reagan will have great difficulty overruling it. Power at all costs. The great Milton Friedman explained, once the po whole population is covered by health insurance, there's little political incentive to increase spending on medical care. Once the bulk of costs have been taken over by the government, as they have in many other countries, the politician does not have the carrot of increased services with which to attract new voters. So attention turns to holding down, holding down costs, that is, rationing. Now for the status, this is the ultimate authority over the individual he has long craved. Once the individual is entrapped, the status controls his fate. The individual will be seduced by the notion that he is receiving benefits from the state when in reality the government is simply rationing benefits. The individual is tethered to the state, relying on it for his health and survival. Not only does the government have an ownership interest in his private property, but it has one in his physical being. Now I should emphasize the extent to which status policies are demonstrably devastating. Let's look at the environmental movement. The environmental movement became prominent in the early 1960s with Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Carson was an opponent of pesticides. She asserted that the chemical DDT, which had been widely used to eradicate malaria, including in the United States, Europe, and Canada, destroyed wildlife, including birds, and exposed children to increased rates of cancer. In a 1972 case brought by the Sierra Club to ban production of DDT in the United States, an administrative law judge at the newly established Environmental Protection Agency found after listening to months of testimony and evidence that DDT was harmless to wildlife and people as used under the regulations. But his decision was overruled by the EPA administrator, William Ruckelshaus, a great hero of the left, He's one of those Republicans that they love to talk to, who hadn't heard or read any of the evidence, yet he banned it. As a result of this decision, many other industrialized nations followed the U.S. and DDT became unavailable to the third world. And that has led to the deaths of millions and millions of poor children in Africa and Southeast Asia. Rachel Carson remains an icon. Her home is a historical site if you ever want to go visit it. And the Sierra Club remains a favorite media source for expertise. Now, when Obama and Congress talk about cafe standards, they rarely talk about the human toll of lighter trucks and cars. In 1999, USA Today reported that 46,000 people had died in crashes. They would have survived in bigger, heavier cars since 1975. Since then, Congress has further increased the cafe standards with precious little concern for the carnage they are mandating. Environmental extremism, ladies and gentlemen, kills. 
And now on to global warming, which they now call man-made climate change because the Earth is cooling. Um, 